In this video, we're going to continue with our uh, discussions on ratios, uh, interpret a few more ratios and introduce a few more ratios as well and try and understand the implication of how do we calculate those ratios and what is the broad interpretation when we look at those numbers and understand those numbers as well. So broadly, we'll begin with the first ratio, which is going to be something known as CAGR or compound annual growth rate. That's the first one we're going to discuss, right? Now, let's assume that the revenue of a company was rupees 500 crore in 2006 and then it's grown to about 1000 crore in 2010. So what is the data given to us? 2006, this number was 500. 2010, this number has grown to something like 1000, right? Now that's a period of four years over which the growth has happened in itself over the four years there is a growth rate of 100 percent however if we were to try and interpret this growth in terms of what has been the average annual growth rate then that's what we are trying to find out in terms of what is called as the CAGR right now uh, one way to look at average is essentially 100% divided by 4 uh, which is going to be 25% but uh, that would have worked if we were looking at something like a simple interest scenario remember in reality there is compounding that is happening which means simple arithmetic average which we have taken here what is this this is arithmetic average this does not work in real life right because uh, 500 growing at 25 percent will become uh, something like uh, you know 125 in the next year so become 625 but then next year the growth would be this into 1 plus 25 percent which creates a problem so this is incorrect when we are using uh, in terms of calculation of returns uh, what we are essentially saying is that we have to identify what is the growth rate that 500 grows over four years and gives me the future value of 1000 right so in a technical sense that's the that's the equation we are trying to solve for and if we solve for the growth in this equation the final answer that we get for growth is what is known as the compound annual growth rate right compounded annual growth rate that's uh, that's essentially what we are trying to solve here right so broadly uh, what we said was uh, revenue has doubled in four years we need to know the rate at which it grows every year so essentially the equation we are trying to solve is 500 into 1 plus g raised to the power 4 is equals to 1000 I can take the next step as 1 plus g raised to the power 4 is equals to 1000 by 500 and then solve it further let's go to the previous slide and solve it once so let's let's write this again 500 into 1 plus g raised to the power 4 is going to be 1000 this would mean 1 plus g raised to the power 4 is equals to 1000 divided by 500 this would mean 1 plus g would be equal to 1000 divided by 500 and we have taken the fourth root on both the sides so raised to the power 1 by 4 and that would mean g would be 1000 divided by 500 raised to the power 1 by 4 minus 1 right that's what we are looking for in terms of CAGR or growth if I generalize the formula so generalizing the formula what we are saying is that CAGR is going to be equal to the final value divided by the initial value in our case the final value was 1000 the initial value was 500 raised to the power 1 by n where n is the number of years over which we are looking this period minus 1 that calculation is going to give us the answer so 100 by 500 1000 by 500 raised to the power 1 by 4 minus 1 
what is the solution that we get to this? That's 1000 by 500 raised to the power 1 by 4 minus 1. We get the answer as 18.92%. What does this mean? Another way to look at it is that if we are looking at the timeline and this is year 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4, if the company keeps growing every year, compounding itself every year at the rate 18.92%, then 500 here would end up becoming 1000 here. So every year the growth in one sense would have been 18.92%. Now remember that's a that's a annualized number that we have arrived at. It is quite possible that the company's sales were the trajectory of sales could have been 500 becoming 700 becoming 800 becoming 900 and then finally becoming 1000. That's possibly the trajectory of sales over these five years. But we are only concerned about what is the annualized number that gives us 500 becoming 1000. We are not really concerned about how did it really do in between in these years. Right, so over that period, what has been the annualized growth is what my CAGR tells me. Now, why is CAGR important is because it gives us growth figures of the company's performance and it tells us how the company has performed over these years in terms of growth numbers. And higher growth numbers obviously are you know, considered, considered to be great. And hence, that is a way where CAGR calculations become important. It might be useful for us to generally calculate CAGR in sales, in costs, in profits, to understand what the company has done over its uh, over its tenure. So that's something that we'll try and calculate in our uh, in our models as we go along, in order to be able to do some sort of financial statement analysis on the companies. That's the first bit of understanding we needed on something known as compounded annualized growth rate, compounded annual growth rate, CAGR, right? That's the new ratio that we have introduced. Let's move ahead and talk about a little bit of interpretation on one of the ratios called return on equity, also known as return on net worth. That's what we had said. And how do you calculate return on net worth? That was net profit divided by the equity of the company, right? Equity being share capital plus reserves and surplus. Both of that amount is considered as equity of the company, right? Now, that interesting analysis on the return on equity and it was done by a company called DuPont and hence the name DuPont analysis. Now, a few things that become interesting about ROE, right? So ROE is net profit divided by equity. Right. What is equity? If you remember, equity is your share capital plus reserves and surplus. Right. Now think about it this way. There's a company which over three years generates the same amount of profit. Right. So that's let's say net profit of the company. Let's also talk about what's the equity value of the company. So in the first year, let's say equity value is 1000. In the second year, assuming the company has not given any dividends, if the company gives dividends, then from the net profit, some part goes out as dividends. But if there is no dividend that is given, the equity will become 1100 because these two will get added, right? And then these two will get added to give you 1200. So if you were to calculate ROE in the first year, you will get an ROE of 100 by 1000. Second year would be 100 by 1100. Third year would be 100 by 1200. Now, profit has remained the same in all these three years, right? But your ROE value will decline purely because the, the company is generating the same amount of profits on a higher equity base. So sometimes it might appear that ROE is going down here, but that may not necessarily be bad or negative, right? Some other times ROE could go up, but it may not be good. When could that be the case, right? Let's assume the company has an equity of 100 and a net profit of 10, right? Now, let's assume the company takes lots of debt, right? Spends this 
on marketing. So the company takes a lot of debt and then spends this entire amount on marketing, which increases sales and results in a very marginal increase in net profit right so let's say net profit becomes 11 sales so that's an increase of 10 percent it's quite possible that sales may have gone up 40 percent right so take a lot of debt spend all of it on marketing increase the sales by whatever amount costs have gone up in terms of marketing cost and interest cost but let's say the net profit has just increased marginally to 11 has there been a change in equity no so when you calculate roe in this case that will go up earlier it was 10 percent now it will be 11 percent right is that good not necessarily because there's a big jump in debt here right so it's important for us to actually decode the roe a little bit more to try and understand where is this jump in the return on equity component coming from unless we are able to zero down on this this fact it's not a correct way to say that return on equity declining always is bad and return on equity jumping upwards always is good you could have a scenario where going down is possibly not so bad and going up is possibly not so good right so for this we want to analyze the entire analysis using this analysis called dupont analysis so let's see what is dupont analysis so let's start from a clean slate and say that return on equity is net profit divided by the equity of the company now we'll do some mathematical jugglery to this right does mathematics allow us to multiply it with sales by sales it does because that sales by sales is going to be one and you can multiply any term with one to get the same answer so you multiply it with sales by sales does mathematics allow us to also multiply it with assets by assets right we can do this as well because both these terms will be one right now we rearrange so mathematically if this is possible all we are going to do is rearrange the items a little bit so sales moves leftwards assets move leftwards and equity comes right at the end right so what we do is we write net profit by sales we write sales by asset assets and we write assets by equity right now let's decode these three what is the first term that we have just identified that's nothing but our net profit margin which talks about how profitable the company is what is the second term that we have just identified sales by assets is nothing but asset turnover ratio which basically talks about how efficient the firm is right and the third one which is assets by equity is known in multiple terms it's also called as the leverage factor some textbooks term it as a term called gearing right I'll decode this a little bit further in simple terms assets of a company is nothing but equity plus debt because equity plus debt should be total liabilities largely right there are some other liabilities but simplistically put asset should be equal to equity plus liability so assets by equity should be e plus d by e which is nothing but one plus debt by equity so if you borrow a lot of debt if you borrow a lot of debt this number might go up marginally in the first few years which might take return on equity higher even without net profit margin jumping or asset turnover jumping this is a factor of the stability of the firm because it gets influenced by the debt equity ratio right so it is important for us to understand that if ROE is increasing where is the increase coming from is it this is it this or is it this 
because mathematically once we zero down on this three stage dupont analysis we can get exactly whether the roe is imp you know in you know essentially affecting the company's profitability or is getting affected from the company's efficiency or is getting affected from the capital structure of the company right so let's re recap this entire bit the first one is nothing but my net profit margin which shows or talks about profitability profitability right the second one is my asset turnover ratio which talks about efficiency if that increases efficiency has gone up the third one is something that talks largely about my capital structure right so an increase in the first two is desirable these two are good an increase in both of these is good but an increase in third is to be viewed with caution so if the roe is going up because assets by equity is going up that's possibly not such a great thing if the roe is going down because assets by equity is going down that's possibly not a very bad thing as well because the company might be repaying some debt if the company repays the debt assets will go down in the near term which might result in a lower assets by equity number mathematically right and that might result in a lower return on equity number for any company that is under consideration so dupont analysis and this is something that we are looking at as a three stage dupont analysis is a very important tool in terms of decoding the moves in roe and roe is an important ratio because it talks from the equity holders perspective what is the money that uh, that the equity holder is making on each rupee of investment or 100 rupees of investment that is done right so effectively if roe is going down consistently we do need to decode it we do need to break it up and find out what is causing that dip in the return on equity right that's what dupont analysis allows us to do and that's one of the most important tasks whenever we are calculating return on equity to be able to arrive at dupont analysis right that's the second bit we wanted to discuss at this stage and uh, let's go ahead and talk about some other ratios now you could have ratios which are cost to sales ratios right every company has a structure which is something like sales and then you have cost 1 you have cost two you have cost three these could be any headers when you are calculating cost to sales ratios you are doing cost 1 by sales you are doing cost 2 by sales and cost 3 by sales why is this important you are trying to find out which comp which cost is the biggest in terms of uh, the entire structure of the company so is this the biggest number or this or this and how does that help us it talks about what is the key cost driver for a company right so for example uh, raw material cost by sales gives the cost of material expressed as a percentage of sales revenue so the first cost could be raw material cost so rm cost divided by sales right employee cost by sales gives employee cost and staff salary etc which is uh, the second important cost header now for manufacturing firms you should ideally see that the first one is higher for service oriented firms you should ideally see that the second is higher right and so the moment you see this one you can compare it across firms and try and find out if there is a company that has a cost advantage so it's important in identification of cost advantages while comparing companies and it is important in terms of broadly understanding sectoral traits why is that important in certain sectors even within manufacturing in certain sectors raw material is a bigger cost component than some other sectors we we'll look at that as we go along and try and understand Uh, in one of the subsequent sessions how we can use some of these metrics to be able to understand and decode how best uh, the numbers uh, kind of come in 
and uh, can we actually arrive at an analysis on what a sector could be for a particular firm without actually uh, looking at uh, without actually looking at uh, the name of the company just by calculating the ratios right that will give us a good understanding on what certain numbers look like in certain sectors as we go along but for now what's important for us is to understand is this relative understanding of cost advantages while comparing companies in the same sector and sectoral traits in terms of which costs are higher and in what sector right some sectors will have marketing cost as high some sectors will have employee cost as high some sectors will have raw material costs as high so it allows us to also figure out which sectors get affected when right so that's just for example if raw material cost is very high for a manufacturing unit and steel costs are high steel is one of the raw materials and steel prices are falling down globally then that's good news why is that good news because input cost goes down for the company which would mean profitability should go up right if the cost goes down profitability should go up so that's where some of these these ratios that we are calculating purely from the pnl become interesting and important for us to analyze that's the cost to sales ratios we are trying to calculate those as well and then finally let's understand the interpretation of interest coverage ratio as well now if you remember we just discussed that any number above 10 is kind of extremely comfortable but to interpret this better let's try and understand taking an example of a company let's say the sales of a company is 1000 and all costs of the company are 900 right let's say this gives an earnings before interest and tax of 100 and let's say the interest component of the company and we're going to vary the interest component for multiple companies and try and see what happens right let's say the interest component is something like 10 which gives an earnings before tax of 90 and then there's a tax component that comes out right compare this to another company that has everything else as the same till here but has an interest component of 80 and we left with ebt of 20 now take the case where the company's sales dip a little bit right so let's change the case and so this is company a this is company b and i'm only going to look at company b right so let's say sales dip by 3% right if sales dip by 3% then in both the cases the sales will become 970 right we are more bothered about what's going to happen to each of these companies as we look at them right costs remain the same because that's not really impacted at this point of time sorry so this is 70 and this is 70 that we are left with interest is 10 in the case of the first company so you still have a profit of 60 but in the second case remember interest is a fixed outflow you have to pay this regardless of what you make right so practically the company is now into default territory and you can easily calculate this if you take 70 by 80 and calculate the interest coverage ratio calculate the interest coverage ratio here interest coverage ratio here would be 10 here would be about 1.25 this would be 7 and this would be less than 1 so close to about 0.85 or something right any number below 1 shows default territory which basically means the company does not have enough profits to be able to meet the interest outgo here the company only has 70 crore of profits but the interest outgo is 80 crore right so that's default territory that's a problem any ratio between 1 and 2 shows trouble so here we should be cautious because this number here shows trouble trouble that if sales dip by as little as 3% right 1000 becomes 970 the company could default now 
if the number is anywhere between 1 and 1.5, that's serious trouble. 1.5 to 2 is trouble asking to happen at some point of time if conditions worsen globally. What could be the problems? Problems could be sales could go down. Problem could be costs could go up, which could be other costs, like raw material costs going up, right? That's not in your hands. So effectively, any interest coverage ratio that you calculate, which is EBIT divided by interest, remember interest coverage ratio was calculated as EBIT by interest. Any number that is between 1 and 2, the ratio shows trouble. Any number above 3, the ratio seems comfortable for the company. So above 3, you are okay. So this is comfortable. This is comfortable. What is worrisome is the lower numbers. So this is trouble and this is default. This number here is trouble. We need to check it carefully. And this number here is essentially default because the company is not going to pay it back. Right? And the company is not in a position to pay it back. So interest coverage becomes an important parameter for us to interpret once again. Specifically these broad rules saying that below 1 is immediate problem. Between 1 and 2 shows trouble. And you should be cautious if you are an analyst on some of these companies which have numbers between 1 and 2. Above 3, that's okay. You're comfortable. Less amount of debt that the company has. That does not really create too much of an issue, right? So that's broadly what we wanted to discuss on some of the ratios uh, as we were trying to calculate these numbers. What we're going to do now in the next section is we're going to immediately calculate some of these ratios for our company under discussion, Aishar Motors, and uh, discuss a little bit more about interpreting the numbers that we see there.